to your neighbor next to your right and to your left. So this evening, um, we are going to continue in the series that we've been going through, which are the churches in Asia, the seven churches in Asia, minor. Um, we've looked at different churches. We've looked at the church in... Uh, who can remind me which ones we've learned? This is Bible study, by the way. Who can remind me which ones we've been taught? We can't remember. Ma? <laughs> Praise the Lord. We've looked at the church in Paganum, the Theatera. We've looked at Smyrna. We've looked at, you know, different churches. And tonight we're going to be looking at the church in Sardis. The church in Sardis is what we're going to look at tonight. It's one of the seven churches. And uh, multimedia, if you can please help me here. Yeah. So, you know, different churches, based on what we read from the book of Revelation, they were classified. There was a compromising church. There was a loveless church. You know, there were lukewarm church. There were different types of churches that we have. Today, church in Sardis was characterized or was categorized as a, a dead church. A dead church, indeed, a dead church, but a dead church that have a great reputation. Praise the Lord. We're going to be reading from the book of Revelations, chapter 3, from verse 1 to 6. Revelations, chapter 3, from verse 1 to 6. Multimedia, please, we can display it. Okay, I'm going to be reading from the NLT version. It says... Write this letter, it's actually on the slide, if you can go to the slide after the one you showed. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is a message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what little remains for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believe at first. Or to hit family. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as, unexpected as a thief. Yet, there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Praise the Lord. So today we're looking at the church in, in, in Sardis. If you go back to the previous slide, the multimedia, please help me. The one that shows the map. So this map you can see where the seven churches we talked about. So you can see those in red dots. You can see Paganum, Theatra, Sardis, Smyrna, Ephesus, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. You will see that if you look in the center, Sardis, uh, church in Sardis is actually kind of like in the middle, okay? So it has churches to the left, to the right, to the center. So it's, it's, it's actually in the center. And you can see the map of the Asia Minor on the, in today's Turkey. So that map is like what you have as a country called Turkey today, if you've flown the Turkish Airlines. So that's Turkey uh, country that we, we, we go through. So anyway, that's the church we are talking about today. So as at the time that Jesus spoke these words that we read, the word that we read in Revelation 3, as at the time Jesus spoke those words to them, the city was actually in its best of days, but it has started to decline, okay? The city was such a wealthy city in the center, and all, it's actually along a great trade route. So it was a center where, you know, there are trades happening, there was easy money, there was a, you know, there was a wealthy city. But it was already, it was already beginning to, to decline. In fact, historians added that the, the, the city itself, because of the easy money, you know, it's like you are in a city, I don't know if it's Abuja that you make easy money these days, I don't know, but somewhere such that no matter what, even in Lagos, if you're doing business in market and all those, somewhere that everybody comes to buy, everybody, you know, there's free flow um, of money. It was, a, it was a place where they said actually the modern money we use today was actually born. So this city, because they had easy money and they had everything going on well. That's the city of Sardis. So the church was in 
city called Sardis. So that's why the church in Sardis. So the church was well known for its uh, softness. Multimedia, please, can you go to the two slides after this, which talks about the city of Sardis? Um, so the church was well known for its luxury. You know, it was a wealthy city. If you look at it on the map on the, on the left, on the left, you will see that the roots and rivers and everything was passing through where uh, Sardis actually is. The city also had uh, these walls. The city was actually walled round. So the soldiers, you know, they were so confident because it was almost impossible to overcome that city because it was well walled. And because of this, that's part of the reason why they had some problems and the church also, you know, the problem of the city rubbed on the church or the, you know, the church was influenced by the world as we have it these days that they were so overconfident. So everybody in the city of Sardis were like, nothing evil can happen, okay? The location was good, it was high on top and it was like in the insurmountable. But despite that, the city was actually captured twice. And the time that the city was captured twice was at night because of their slackness. They were so, they were so relaxed that you know, they were not watchful. Praise the Lord. So we've talked about the city. In fact, on the two occasions, on the two occasions, on one of the occasions where the, church, the city was conquered, we were told that the enemies actually were positioned and they were trying to see how they can conquer that city. So what they found out was there was a soldier sitting on the wall and the helmet fell down. So, and it was rolling down. So, of course, he couldn't do it. But there was a path that was created. You know, it was not noticeable to outside world, but they've created it so that you can actually descend. So the enemy noticed that, and they took advantage. At night, they just went to conquer the city, and they conquered it. The same thing happened about 200 years later. So, it's just to see how a city that thought everything was going well, you know, could easily be surmounted by, by the enemy. And also the church at that time was also overcome by that they became dead because they just couldn't uh, they just couldn't keep watch praise the lord okay so we've talked about the city itself that's the city of sardis if you go to the next slide so the the the, the church in sardis the status of the church as we described you know we've talked about the city now how was the church as at the time that jesus was speaking the words to them so in that Revelation 3, in that Revelation 3 that we read, it says, one, if you go to one B, it says, I know all the things you do. I know your works in the other version. I know all the things that you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. If you go to verse 2B, it says, I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. We can see from here that even at the church that time, if you look at the church, it was like everything was bubbling, you know. From the, somebody looking from it from outside, it wasn't obvious that something was going wrong because maybe they were doing services, business as usual. You know, they were, things were going on and nobody would have noticed that they were actually on decline. But here, the Spirit was telling the church that no matter what you do, nothing is hidden. Even to the in, innermost part of our hearts, as Christians, you know, we, the previous speakers before today, they've defined what the church is, so I didn't bother to, to go back to define some of the definitions they've done, because the church is not just a building, it's actually you and I, when we talked about the church. Nothing is hidden from, from the Lord. If you do anything, if you do eye service, he knows what you're doing. If you do it to please the pastors, because he knows what you're doing. If you're doing what you're doing because you want to get a position, you can see. If you're doing it genuinely from your heart, the Lord can see, and is the is the rewarder. No matter what we do, there will be a reward, whether positive or negative. We can also see here that from those verses that we read, the three one B and two B. You know, this, they had good reputation. The church at that time had good reputation, but the Spirit was saying, "It's not what the world is seeing that I'm seeing, and it's what God sees that really matters." You know, the church was very busy. But they were guilty. How many times are we actually busy, but we are guilty? Even as individual Christians, that we know that you just want to be seen. You just want to, how would they say, I'm not, I'm not attending Bible study. You know, how would they say, but deep down in your heart, you know there's no connection. The connection you have with God is not there. So, we know the, the story in the Second Kings 2, 19, when they, they told Elisha, this city looks beautiful, you know, but the water is bitter. That's exactly the same thing, because looking from it, it looks so 
perfect, but something was wrong in the foundation. We can also see here that, as at that time, the church was unscriptural, unspiritual, you know, they were not posing any threat to the kingdom of darkness because as, as the church, the church was supposed to, Bible says the, the church will march on and the gate of hell will not prevail. The gate of hell is supposed to be afraid of the church, even as you as individuals. But they were just living like normal, like every other, of the other person on the street. They were living like civilians, not soldiers. And that's what, in that we can see that they had the reputation uh, but they do not meet the requirements of God. They can do, they have actions. They have things they were doing, but they were not actually in the kingdom of God, in the scheme of God, in, this, in the scheme of the things of God, the Lord found the church wanting, wanting at that time. And indeed, they were, you know, if you were to score them, whether they were below expectation, they were meeting expectation, or they were exceeding expectation, or they were outstanding, you will see that the church that time, as Jesus was describing it, you know, they were below expectation. They were not meeting. In fact, they were considered dead. And we all know what the definition of dead is. A dead person is, cannot feel anything. You know, they were, they were say, said as they, they, they had look of being alive, but they, are actually, they were actually dead. We could see that time that what happened to that city, that time that the city thought they were okay, but the enemy penetrated subtly, even when they were not keeping watch at night and over, overcame the city. The same thing was happening to the church that time. And the same thing is still happening to us today. How many of us are it's the same way when we first accepted Christ? It's still the same with the zeal we have to serve the Lord. You know, it's not that when we are told to do things, we just do it because we are being coerced or being forced to do it for God. It's not coming from our heart. The believers then, they were spiritually overconfident. And they believed that they were so spiritually secure that they didn't give any thought that the enemy could attack their souls. And the same way today, sometimes we feel, oh, I'm, I belong to Redeemed Christian Church of God. No evil can happen to me. Yes, no evil can happen to you. But if you don't keep watch, you know, if you don't keep, because you are supposed to watch and pray, not because you are in the Redeemed Christian Church of God, but because you are a child of God and you're supposed to be posting threats to the kingdom of the enemy. You're supposed to be watching and praying. Praise the Lord. The Lord will, will help us in Jesus' name. Okay. So we can say here, as I move on from this slide, that about the status of the church in Sardis, that by all appearances, the church was a vibrant, effective church, but in, to the outside world, but inside, they are lifeless. They were lifeless at the time. So what about you? Are we just seeing you as somebody holding title in church? Are we just seeing you as somebody that, as you said, you claim that you gave your life to Christ 40 years ago or 30 years ago or 20 years ago? Are you, supposed to, are you where you're supposed to be even in, the, in your walk with the Lord based on the time we know that you gave your life to Christ? This is a call this evening. Do you have a name that it seems that you are alive? We can see that, oh, when we call for this, you are there. When we call for that, you are there. But actually, you are found wanting. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, just um, to also describe, to also describe that church and to bring it home more. Also, maybe in like you know what the church were. You remember the story of Samson. Samson was somebody that had power. You know, God gave the Holy Spirit was with him, and he could kill me. With, you know, with the job of an ass and all these things that he did, and it seemed like it wasn't ordinary. But what happened? It's left over. You know, on the Delilah's uh, lap, before you knew it, everything changed. But then Samson thought, he see, at the point in time, he thought he still had that, uh, uh, the spirit of God in him, that he could still do what he used to do. But what happened? The enemies just removed his eyes, and you, you know the story, that the Lord has departed from him. The same way a dead church or a dead individual spiritually, you know, they may not have the sermon that the Lord has departed. And that's why we are calling us this evening to check ourselves, to check ourselves, to make sure that we are not actually dead, but we are just a li you know, we are not walking corpses spiritually. And if any one of us is in that category, the Lord will wake us up this evening in the name of Jesus. Okay, so what does Jesus want at that time? What did Jesus want the church at Sardis to do uh, that time? So we have it. It says in the book of Revelation 3, verse 2a, it says, wake up. Wake up. Say to your neighbor, wake up. 
Talk to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, wake up. If you've been sleeping, it's time to wake up. Because we are being charged this evening to say, wake up and strengthen what little remains. For what even that is left, the little that is left is almost dead. Thankfully, in the case of the Church of Sardis, it's not 100% written dead and buried. Because even that situation was not still considered hopeless. And whatever we have today, I want us to know that if you think uh, there's no way I can, I can be reconciled back to God, it's not, you, are still, you are still alive. There is still hope. There's still hope. You know, Jesus was given the church when he said, wake up and strengthen what little that remains. He was giving them a charge. He was giving them a warning to repent and turn to God. Okay? Because at that time, the spirituals, they became, like we've described, spiritually complacent. They were weak. They were no longer fervent. They became spiritually lazy. And they were not guarding their hearts from spiritual attack. It's the same way today, if we check, let's check ourselves. Are you not being spiritually complacent? Are you not being too lazy to read your Bible, to wake up to pray? When they say join open heavens, um, pray as you go in the morning, you feel mm, it's just a waste of time. Are you not thinking that um, everything is going rosy? Why do I really need to serve God the way I used to serve God fervently? We should, we should, we should retrace our steps. The Lord is charging us this, this evening. We're supposed to guard our hearts. From, from all forms of attacks and, and, and distractions. The Bible says we should keep our hearts uh, with all diligence for heart of it are the issues of life. So it's telling us to awake from slumber. Ephesians 5.14 says, Ephesians 5.14, it says, Therefore it says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And I pray that everyone who is asleep spiritually today, the Lord will wake you up in the name of Jesus. And the time to be awake is now. The time to be awake is now because tomorrow might be too late. Delay is very dangerous. If you think, you know what, I still want to relax. I still want to, uh, we let them do it. I'm not, it doesn't concern me. If you are thinking that way, delay is very dangerous because tomorrow might be too late. In the, in the book of Romans 13, 11 to 12, it says, Romans 13, 11 to 12, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is fast spent. The day is at hand. So again, say to your neighbor, wake up. And wake up now. <laughs> because the time is now. Praise the Lord. We are also being charged to be watchful. From that verse that Jesus, you know, uh, what Jesus was saying to the church inside is the same thing he's saying to us today. That we should be watchful. Because... You know, in this, the story we talked about, the city of Sardis, that they were conquered, they were easily conquered twice. It wasn't that the enemies, they overwhelmed Sardis that time. No. It was because they were so overconfident, and they, because they were overconfident, it stopped them from being watchful. They, because they thought we had everything working for us, so why should we be watchful? That was what happened. And the spiritual state of the church at that time is exactly what was happening even in the city when Jesus was addressing them. The same way, are you not being overconfident that, oh, you know, it's like once saved, forever saved? Of course, we know that there's nothing like that. You know, that's not, that's not the doctrine we preach. You know, you have to, you know, guard your, your, your salvation with fear and trembling. Praise the Lord. Bible says in the book of 1 Peter 5, 8, that we should be sober we should be vigilant because the adversary, our adversary, the devil, is, is moving about like a roaring lion and is seeking whom he may devour. So I pray that the Satan will not devour us in Jesus' name. Beware of those little foxes, such as overconfidence. When they say we should fast, you believe, maybe we fasted last time. That fast should suffice for now. Don't go into that attitude. Don't put on some attitude that you are being rebellion to authority. Those, those little foxes, they can spoil the vine. And I pray that the Lord will open our eyes to see where we are not being watchful so that we can quickly repent in Jesus' name. If you go to the next slide, verse 3a of that Revelation 3, 3a, it says, go back to what you heard and believed it, that you believed at first. Or to each family, repent and turn to me again. So we can see here how they were being charged. You know, they were being encouraged and, and, and asked to, to go back to remember their first love. 
to remember how they first received and heard the word of God. The same way we are being charged when you first gave your life to Christ and you were serving God with all zeal. How were you doing it? Are you still, by that time, if you were to be moving at the same pace you were moving that time, are you where you are today, where you are supposed to be, or you have gone back many times and, and, and struggling and, and behaving like the church in Sardis that were considered a dead church but had little thing remaining in them? We can see that in the book of First Thessalonians 2.13, uh, Apostle Paul described uh, the kind of uh, what we, our attitude should be to the, to the word of God and what we needed to remember. It says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcome it not as the word of men, but as in, is in the truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Thank God for the series we've had in the open heavens, and I thank God for my sister that took the open heaven on Sunday about the word of God. We know how we're supposed to take and live our life, you know, according to the word of God. The word of God we receive, we need to act it, we need to digest it, we need to live our life daily on the word of God so that we don't remain in this state. Then we have to, they were being encouraged also to hold fast. Those word of God that you've had and, you, and we should be feeding on the word of God every day, we should hold fast to those things. We should examine our ways and we should repent by turning back to God. Lamentation 340, Lamentation 340 says, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. This is what the Lord is calling us. It was what he was calling, uh, the Lord was calling the church in Sardis at that time. And that is what the Lord is calling every one of us this evening. Let us search out and examine our ways. Examine your ways is a call to repentance. It's a call to revival. Let us search out and examine our ways, Lamentations 3.40, and turn back to the Lord. And you know, if a church or an individual is not willing to hold fast to the word of God and leave it and guard it and faithfully also preach it, you know, preach it, because if you want to stay alive, you need to spiritually, you cannot be seen not preaching the word of God. If, if, if you are not preaching the word of God as you are to, you are also considered dead. Because part of what you are, your, your, your duty is, as a Christian that believes and you, and you want to remain vibrant and alive for God, is for you to be preaching the word of God. Praise the Lord, in season and out of season. Romans 12, 11 says, Romans 12, 11 says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. This is what we are expected to do. We should not be found slothful when it comes to the kingdom business, when it comes to our relationship with God, when it comes to our spiritual life, we should not be found slothful. We should be fervent in spirit and we should continually serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Another version of that Romans 12, 11 message version says, Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master. Cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help others and be inventive in hospitality. The Lord will help us, you know, to carry out what we are expected to do in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to be looking at the consequences of not eating to this church that, you know, uh, the, the, church of, the church in Sardis was being charged to wake up. They were being charged to strengthen that little thing which remains. You know, they were being asked to not stay in the state where they were, but to, re to be returned back to the original state. You know, our team for this month defined re divine repositioning, and we have these three words, the revival, reposition, restoration, and repositioning. It was exactly the same thing that the Lord was telling the church of inside this at that time, you know, to, 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 to be awake to, for revival, restoration, and for divine repositioning to where they were supposed to be in Christ. So what are the consequences of not heeding? The Bible says in Revelation 3, 3b, that we read, we read also. It said, therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. You know, it says, if you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. We can see here that there's a great, uh, uh, severe consequence if they refuse to wake up. Because Jesus warned them of that danger in failing to watch. And if they ignore this command, uh, to be watchful. The same thing that Jesus is, you know, the word of the Lord is coming to us this evening, that we should be watchful. 
Jesus said he will come to them upon as a thief at a time that they did not expect. So how, can, how will Jesus come to them when he said I will come to you, that portion that says I will come upon you, how will Jesus come upon them? And it's the same way that he's talking to us. You know, it could come in the sense of bringing immediate judgment. We know the story of the rich fool in the Bible. Luke 12, 12 from 16 to 21, I will read it quickly. The parable of the rich fool. Luke chapter 12 from verse 16. It says, then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I will have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I will sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you have worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. This, this was like immediate judge because the guy, the, 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 the person we read about in this parable, you know, he said, every, just like the church in Sardis, everything was going on well that they were not careful and they just feel, you know, just relax. There's no cause for alarm. But I tell you, the Bible called him rich fool and that night his soul was requested and, he, you know, he, he actually died that, that, that night based on uh, the Bible. So you can see there can be immediate judgment if we fail to wake up. If we fail to strengthen that which remains, that is about to die, if we fail to repent, there might be immediate judgment. My prayer is that we will repent on time so that we will not experience immediate judge, God's judgment in Jesus' name. You know, again, when Jesus said, I will come to you suddenly, in that verse we read, it could also come in a sense, you know, we've been talking about rapture of the church. The rapture can happen, even as we are speaking now, it can happen. Are you really prepared to meet the Lord? Are you ready? If the trumpet shall sound now, can you both lead, you know, say, I am ready to go with the Lord? Or you still have some little, little sins that you are nudging, that you are not seeing in your corner. My prayer is that before it is too late, we will repent in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17, the Bible says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. That is rapture being described there. My prayer is none of us here will miss the rapture. In the name of Jesus, the Lord will make us to be rapturable in the name of Jesus. Whatever that is serving like impediment in our life that does not want us to reign with the Lord, the Lord will take it off and deal with them from our life today before it is too late in Jesus' name. Okay, and of course we know there could be eternal judgments where it will say you go to, go to this side, you sheep go to this side, and they will you know, be cast into the lake of fire, those that refuse to wake up and those that refuse to to heed to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, we're going to look at, you know, in that verse, we, um, we, the verses we read, three and, uh, verse 4 and 5, the next slide. Um, so, there are still in the midst of, so that's, this, uh, uh, okay, thank you. So, in the midst of this corruption, let's read it again. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white. For they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. So you can see that even among the dead Christians in Sardis, there were still some faithful remnants, although they were very few, based on how the Bible showed it. But what this is telling us is that even in the midst of corruption going on in the church, in the world, everywhere, in the midst of everybody falling asleep, you know, just like those ten virgins, you know, it was story of ten virgins. There were five virgins that refused to sleep, and they waited, you know, they, they waited for the, the bridegroom to come, and when he came, they were met prepared. So it's still, still, it is still possible to say, even among 
whatever is, is happening in the world today, if it's, you know, some people say it's, it's very difficult to be a Christian, yes. It's difficult to be a Christian in the workplace where they are changing numbers. It's very challenging. But is it possible? It is possible to remain a Christian. It is still possible for you to remain as an ambassador of the Lord. It is still possible for them to know that this one, you better leave her or him. She will not, she will not you know, she's a person of, he or she's a person of integrity. Uh, no, she carried that religion on top of her head that she will not do whatever you're asking her to. It is still possible. It is, it is difficult, but it is possible. And that's why in this place, we can see the benefit of, of those that, that, that stay that stay that stay uh, stayed alive in Christ. It says the pure will walk with the Lord. We know the story of Enoch. Bible says Enoch walked with the Lord, and he, for he was not, but, but God took him. Even in the, in the midst of that, we could see how Enoch had a friendship with God, and indeed he walked with the Lord. Praise the Lord! And of course, we can see here that Jesus talks about that he will clothe them in white. Those few that they will be clothed in white. That even though there was compromise everywhere, but their own garment will remain not soiled. It will remain pure white. Holiness is a watchword. You know, in the redeemed Christian Church of God, for us to do what we needed to do, our vision, holiness will be our watchword. And I pray that every one of us will live a life of holiness in the name of Jesus. And of course, we are promised closer intimacy with the Father and name in the book of life. Praise the Lord. So they say it comes with a reward. It comes to the reward that he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garment like we read, and their names will not be blotted out from the book of life. And the Lord will confess their names before the Father and before his angels. Praise the Lord. So the difference, if you look at this few we discuss, we describe, the difference between the majority that are dead and the, their works, he said, yes, they have works, they have actions, but it was found not meeting God's standard. The difference between those ones and those that have, that, 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 that please God. So those ones that we discussed that they are dead majority, that their works were not perfect. But you know they had good reputation. People know, they all know she's, yeah, she's, yeah, you know, she's associated with church. She's associated with church. Can, you know, people knew them with church. So they had reputation of being churchy people, right? And the difference between them and those very few that please God, like we said, is holiness. Holiness. Say to your neighbor, holiness. Holiness. That is the difference between the two because those few decided to keep themselves holy. Praise the Lord. So holiness is very, very critical and I'm sure we all know the definition of holiness, right? If I ask what is the holiness, we all know what holiness means. We need to live a life that is absolutely pleasant to God. Praise the Lord. Absolute obedience to God. Praise the Lord. So we also see here that Jesus said he will not blot their name, he will not erase their names from the book of life. So this is a promise of heavenly citizenship. You know, when we refuse to soil ourselves with all the corruption going on, whether in the church or outside, when we live a life of holiness, we are assured overcomers, we are assured of our heavenly citizenship. Praise the Lord. And we know there's a book of life. The book of life is real. And whoever's name is not found in the book of life will be cast into the everlasting uh, fire. My prayer is so Revelation 20, 12. And I saw the book. I saw the dead. Revelation 20, 12. Talking about the book of life. And I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The book of life is what determines if you will go to heaven or you will go to hellfire. So, Jesus is saying it's only those that live a life of holiness. Only those that live a life expecting God and that's how they live their daily life from one second to the next. Only those that their names are found in the book of life will, will go to heaven. Anyone Verse 15 of Revelation 20 says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay? So we need to make every effort, whatever we need to do, you know, to live a life that will guarantee our name being in the book of life. My prayer is that our, name, our names will never be blotted 
out from the book of life in Jesus' name. And if your name is not yet written in the book of life by giving your life to, to Christ and surrendering your life to Christ and living a life of holiness, today is the day of repentance. Today is the day because tomorrow might be too late. Praise the Lord. It's important for us to accept Jesus, but it's far more important for Jesus to accept us. So it's because sometimes we do, we claim things that indeed truly, truly we are not. But Jesus knows our hearts, like we started that at the beginning. He knows the genuineness of your service. He knows what you are up to. My prayer is that Jesus himself, we, like he said here, I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. So my prayer is that the Lord will help us so that Jesus himself will recognize us as being children of God in Jesus' name. So, and lastly, as we round up, before we take questions and we pray, this, this is a call to revival and restoration. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, Anyone with hears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. It's a call to revival today. It's a call to restoration, divine repositioning, spiritual repositioning in Christ. It's a warning that don't become spiritually overconfident. Don't say because you have been working, with, uh, we've been working with the Lord this way, so you are too over familiar with God and you begin to lose it. It's a warning to become, to, be, to refrain from becoming spiritually careless. Don't be careless. Don't be complacent regarding your actions and the attacks of the enemy. It's a call to allow, don't let the ease of life, oh, I have a good job. Oh, I have a good home. Oh, I have some good, you know, you, you, things are working well. Don't let that lure you to going to sleep spiritually. But there's a race that is set before us, looking onto Jesus and making sure that we continually run, run the race. You know what happened to Sadis can happen to any believer when we become too confident, when we think we are spiritually okay, when we think we are spiritually untouchable by the, any temptation. Don't say... No, no woman can tempt me. Don't, you know, don't, and then you just go about, you know, walking the way God has not allowed you to walk, but you just feel, no, nothing can happen. It can, it can happen to others, but not me. And you are not being watchful, and you are not being careful. This is a call today not to, to be spiritually, not to let down our guard spiritually. Praise the Lord. Don't underestimate the enemy. Bible says, let him that thinks he stands, take it. Let's see for don't, don't, don't think the enemy is not there to, to after you because he's running, he's going about. We should be sober and vigilant because the, dead, the devil, our adversary, is running about like a, a, an hungry lion, seeking for whom he may devour. Don't let the enemy meet you unguarded. Praise the Lord. The fact that you are not fighting spiritual battles now, that you are not you know, going through some difficulties now, it doesn't mean that the enemy is taking a break. Okay? So we have to be because he's, all, he's constantly looking for those loopholes. He's looking for those small, you know, small chance for him to strike, even if you believe you are standing for those fields that are left. He's looking for that time. Be on guard. Be watchful. Okay? Be watchful. And let's know that the hour has come for us to wake up from, from our slumber because the, our salvation is nearer now than when we believe. Wake up and be watchful. Restore your first love. Let's go back to our first love when we used to Pray, maybe you used to pray 30 minutes every day, but now it's in the car. You'll be saying, God, thank you for today. I commit today to your hands. And you don't have time to spend with God. It's a call for us to go back, to be restored back to our first law. Strengthen that which remains. It says it's very little. It's very little, but it's about to die. Don't let it die. Strengthen it and wake up, and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Okay, Revelation 22, 12 says, And behold... I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. My prayer is that when that reward is coming, we will be duly and positively rewarded in the name of Jesus. Okay, let's stop here and ask questions, and then we go to pray. Any questions or contributions? Any contributions or questions? <laughs>